Okay, thanks everybody for joining us uh, today. Uh, my name is Theodor Sparopoulos and I have the, the pleasure uh, today of introducing Moshe Safdi and uh, welcoming him back uh, sorry, welcoming him back to the Architectural Association. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of points because uh, we're bringing to a close a lecture series called Adaptive Ecologies uh, which was set up in part as a way to sort of tease out certain questions that had to do with architecture, urbanism, new technologies, different ways that we could sort of approach the problem of architecture today. And I think in many ways uh, I feel very fortunate that Mr. Safdi has uh, agreed to give a, a lecture today. And this, uh, to be honest, has really been facilitated by Ryan Dillon, who has also been quite instrumental in bringing together a lot of the material with me working on this Adaptive Ecologies initiative. With that, I think uh, we've had a series of different uh, invited guests talking about a range of different issues, from Yasha Reichart talking about cybernetics and its role within art and technology, to Rupert Soar uh, considering new ideas of making and uh, what that actually constitutes within the idea of computation, ideas of 3D printing today. And, and I was reminded actually in a conversation with Ryan prior to Mr. Softy's uh, trip today uh, of a piece that he actually wrote in a book uh, which is called The Magic Machine. And I thought instead of actually uh, mentioning all the projects and the accolades that Mr. Softy has uh, obviously contributed to the discourse of architecture, I thought it would be interesting and quite telling, I think, of actually sort of reading out a small passage that he wrote post-Habitat, uh, because I think a lot of the problems that we were looking at in the Design Research Lab, specifically to do with housing, uh, resonated quite a lot with a lot of the work that he was doing, and particularly how he thought about housing. Uh, he mentioned the problem of building, which was about adaptability into the house, and I think that pursuit uh, for him in particular was about thinking about greater variation. And to sort of complement that, particularly within this magic machine, if you will allow me the opportunity to read this passage, because I feel it resonates very much with a lot of the problems that we actually have today, actually in considering the approach of how we work on the problem, not only of housing, but architecture communicated within a much larger uh, community fostering a certain kind of culture and a certain kind of social accountability which I feel resonates with this. But he mentions our problem is always to combine order and freedom. Freedom without chaos and order without sterility. Heretofore we have thought of a building in terms of the technology of today, the stamping machine, repetition. But the technology of building will become all capable, like a computer punch card with millions of possibilities, extended in four dimensions, or fluids capable of limitless forming. Ultimately, I would like to design a magic housing machine to do just that. Conceive of a huge pipe behind which a reservoir of magic plastic, a range of air pressure nozzles around the opening controlling this material as it's forced through the edges of the pipe. By varying the air pressure of each nozzle, one could theoretically extrude any conceivable shape, complex free forms, mathematically non-defined forms. People could go and push the buttons to design their own dwellings. He continues, this is a very exciting idea, indeed because it suggests that in the ultimate evolution of technology in the building process, we may find that the highest form of organization means the least standardization that technology can make industry as flexible as nature. I haven't yet been able to translate this into a building solution any more than I have technically solved the six component assembly. But I am convinced that in Habitat there is a seed that will eventually grow to the point where the individual has much greater ability to shape and change his living space, so to produce something that corresponds, corresponds much cl more closely to his feelings of what his whole environment should be. And that is an idea of the vernacular, which is made by men for themselves, 
and the architect is their instrument. I'd like to thank Mr. Safdie for the kind words because they resonate with us, I think, now more so than they ever. And with that, I'd like us to please warmly welcome Mr. Safdie to the AA 42 years later. Thank you, Theo. Forty-two years later, I still haven't solved it. And it's actually 42 years since uh, I spoke uh, in the school last time. So it's very moving for me to be back. Uh, yesterday, I met uh, Peter Palumbo, who told me, oh, you're speaking at the AA. In 1942, Frank Lloyd Wright came to speak there in the middle of the war. And uh, he said, well, 60 minutes, one can't really talk about architecture, so I'll do a Q&A. Uh, well, I'll try uh, in 60 minutes. I think we tend to present our work and talk about it, but I feel it's important, particularly today, put it in the greater context of where architecture is, where it's going, and what are the bigger issues that we, as a profession, face. Uh, it's got a lot to do with trying to appreciate what guides us uh, and what inspires us uh, and the difference between the two. Um, and it seems to me that all of this is occurring in a new kind of reality, a reality in which the, both in architecture and in urbanism, both, uh, the context in which we uh, work is completely changed uh, beyond anything we were able to imagine 40 years ago. So if I wrote that paragraph, I was dreaming and hoping, but here we are 40 years later and the context or the issues we need to solve, we could not have possibly imagined. And I'll elaborate on that. But I think it's important also to relate uh, to where things stand ideologically. Um, I guess I would put it in terms of what are the principles or the ethic that guides us as architects or what each of us as an individual is guided by? And I think in the 60s, uh, there was this uh, sense that everything we did as architects somehow connected with society's well-being. There was a causality, a connection between what we aspire to do and the welfare of society as a result of it. And if I was to sort of do an overview about recent decades, I would say that these have, have been the promiscuous decades. I think they've been a time of indulgence. And I guess I would even go as far as saying it's been a hedonistic period in architecture. Um, I'm generalizing, I know. But if I'm to quote, going back to the 1980s, Philip Johnson, who was a great propagandist of the profession, and some of us feel at this point in time, looking back, maybe one of the great corruptors of, of the profession. He said at the time, he summed it all up and he says, there are no rights or wrong in architecture or the arts today, only the world of wonderful freedom. And he believed that in that statement, he was elevating architecture to the level of the other visual arts that architecture is expressive, that it a, does not function within constraints, and as an expressive art, there, is, there are no rules and just the world of wonderful freedom. And I think it's not surprising that this kind of indulgent uh, period has occurred also when in the body politic, it's been the age of the market knows best. Uh, perhaps we are now for the first time Sorry, huh? two sides to the room. Uh, for the first time, uh, re-examining this notion that the market knows best. 
that perhaps society has to have some regulatory systems in place. Um, and the context of all of this is in the body culture is that this has been the period of branding. Um, it's been, there's been an extraordinary alliance, I think, between the world of architecture and the world of fashion. Uh, one breeds the other. And think of all the new terminology. Uh, 40 years ago, we did not speak of signature architecture. And we did not yet uh, talk about star architects, even though there may have been some. And uh, if I hear one more time a client said, you must give me an iconic building, uh, and it better have the wow factor, I will really go crazy. Uh, and to quote Octavio Paz, the Mexican philosopher, as he said at the time, the market is blind and deaf. It's not fond of literature. It does not know how to choose. Its censorship is not ideological. It has no ideas. It knows only about prices, nothing about values. And I suppose it is about values that we must focus today, today's discussion. So before going on to show some of our work, I would like to try and attempt to uh, uh, describe uh, a few themes that make up for me an ethic of architecture. Uh, and I know that uh, there are many uh, takes on this and uh, each of us have their own priorities. But I would begin by saying uh, some obvious things. Architecture is material. Uh, it is informed by structure and building systems which are fundamental to its language. And as such, it's also the source of both inspiration and expression. I like to use the term, how to achieve inherent buildability. How is a concept of a building embedded in its inherent buildability? I think that that implies an economy which is inher inherent in nature. Um, it is what differentiates architecture from sculpture? And as a footnote, I would say reflecting on computers, which have sort of uh, taken over our lives in a way, computers are extraordinary tools for form making. They are not exactly great tools for structural ordering. And in a sense, they always raise the question of when you can do anything, what is appropriate? But I do think that one of the things uh, that computers provide us is the dream, the capacity that we can now pursue fitness in design in the Darwinian sense of that term. I think another theme that pervades my search in architecture is the centrality of program, or as you call it here, the brief. Uh, that is the life intended in the building. It seems to me that appreciating that is a source of invention in architecture. And I go back to the words of Louis Kahn when he said simply, let the building be what it wants to be. If you're designing a school, the final question is, is it a wonderful place for learning? All other questions become secondary, and so on for anything you do. To me also, place is central theme in terms of evolving a design. Architecture is particular, and how it grows from the context of where you build and this is not just the site, the climate, uh, the secrets of a site, uh, but the deep cultural context and history of a place. Another way of putting it in this age of globalization where everything becomes the same no matter where you are is, how do you make a building truly belong to where it is being built? But the order of the day 
as I've titled my lecture also, is Megascale. How do we humanize Megascale? Megascale is here to stay. Extraordinary densities, extraordinary concentration. Uh, the results of demographics, the results of urbanization, but we are building, I mean, there was no way we could imagine uh, the kind of densification and urbanization that would occur 30, 40 years ago. But the problems it sets for us have no precedent historically. We have no place to go back in history to tell us how to deal with these kinds of densities in terms of the humanizing of what we are building. Um, so I'd like to take you back to pretty well the time I lectured here last time. 1973, I traveled to China. Cultural revolution. I had the good fortune to travel throughout the country. This is Beijing, 1973. Very few cars. Uh, not, not a single high-rise building, neither in Shanghai. Uh, this is in my lifetime, and I went back years later. We now are building there. This is Beijing today. So in a lifetime, the transformation of a city within the tree line into this kind of scale and this kind of density. This is Shanghai which only had the Bund in 1973. Sao Paulo, where you see the old fabric and in a helicopter for 40 minutes, this texture and scale does not change. Hong Kong. So I'd like to do a little historic review in terms of my own interaction and going back. This is Bath familiar to most of you, 19th century urbanism. The street, the square, the circus, individual buildings, the 19th century urbanism forming the urban fabric. Individual buildings creating urban place. And then, in a kind of a shortcut, uh, modernism, this is Hilversheimer, 1923, the ideal city on one side, and Ebenezer Howard, the other reaction, the Garden City, on the other. And it is important to reflect that these images of the new kind of city made up of dense high-rise buildings was conceived as the ideal. And whatever we le then came to appreciate their shortcomings was not then understood. Uh, when I was a student at McGill, I had a fellowship to study housing across North America. And we went and visited public housing projects, uh, the sort of uh, manifestation of these ideas. This is Stuyvesant Town in New York. Uh, and realizing this kind of reality of a new urbanism. And on the same trip, Suburb after suburb, Levittown after Levittown of urban sprawl. And here were the two paradoxes. On one side, dense urban housing, as you've seen, and at the other side, urban sprawl on the other, on the other extreme scale. And it was this, I think, wonderful cartoon that manifested how, in giving up 19th century urbanism, this was the outcome. So I'd like to go just briefly back to Habitat, which will soon turn 50. And as a student doing my thesis, I had basically a simple idea. I thought if we can design apartment buildings that have the quality of life of a single family house, people won't go to the suburbs anymore. Um, and how to create that would be to basically break up the building, fractalize it, uh, create uh, outdoor spaces for each and every house, create streets instead of double loaded corridors. I was reacting to the unité d'habitation that I thought was kind of a 
sellout at the time, that all the wonderful sketches of Le Corbusier of the 20s and so on all of a sudden got translated into this super block, which seemed to me to be the epitome of the previous promise. And so this really became like a hill town without the hill. We had thoughts about prefabrication, if we could have everything magically produced in a production line, in a factory condition, uh, we'll solve all the economies of, uh, of housing. Uh, and while I can report uh, today that habitat has not proliferated, I can also report that it has been extremely successful in terms of people's desire to live there, to the quality of life that it offered. Uh, in fact, at this point, you see it with the patina of 45 years of uh, life uh, within it, uh, and it's in fact been now declared as a, a heritage building, so even the maintenance is contributed to by the government. Uh, but uh, in a fellowship in our office two years ago, a research fellowship, we decided to go back and rethink habitat. If we were doing it today, what has changed? Well, the circumstances have changed because the densities have changed. Um, nevertheless, we said, let's go and look at it uh, without the constraint of the practice itself. And we realized that we're looking at fractalization, at porosity. It was all about light, and it was, we believed, about mixed use. Fractalization, the breaking up of the surface to create this kind of uh, more complex uh, capability of indoor and outdoor life, and the most complex study of light penetration to try and reach the lowest crevices in the urban structure. And a year later, we had a collection of models uh, uh, working uh, in the workshop, and we realized that there were many answers to the question of how to redo habitat. One could say uh, it was too expensive. How could we simplify the construction? How could we line up the structure and the plumbing in a way that would be simpler to do? And could we achieve that in a load-bearing system that uh, was cheaper to build? Perhaps this would be a third of the cost of what we built in Montreal in 67. And yet, could we achieve gardens and outdoor spaces and open streets, etc.? Another proposition was to say, could we achieve the greatest possible densities that are built today. So we took Midtown Manhattan, which you see right there, and we mapped the uh, floor, ratio, floor area, uh, offices, residences, retail, and we start studying how to reorganize that in a mixed-use uh, clustering of structures, putting the offices lower levels, the housing where the views are better, uh, and stacking these up to create what we call the urban windows so that if they're built along a waterfront or central park or whatever, they don't form walls but actually maintain a certain porosity in terms of the impact on the city. And we achieved, in, as you see in these sketches, the density of Manhattan while at the same time maintaining a lot of the qualities of habitat with its terraces with its public walkways at various levels, with community streets that interweave at various levels, and so on and so forth, forming membranes which were uh, inclined towards the light and greater densities, and studying this on and on with the objective of could we achieve in mixed use the densities of Hong Kong and Shanghai in a quality of life that surpasses the current vernacular, if I can call it vernacular. And as often happens, the spin-off immediately into the practice. This is a project under construction in Qingwandao on the coast in, uh, in China, not far from Beijing, uh, with buildings uh, very high density. Uh, there is development already on the back of that seacoast site so that they were very happy about the fact that these urban windows did not uh, block entirely the seafront. In Singapore, middle-income housing, 
uh, under construction again with the kind of terracing, streets in the air, uh, and this is actually being built and sold to in middle income housing. So all of a sudden we see that we are able today to come back and achieve things we had put on paper many years ago within the context not of a World's Fair, but uh, the, the real development world. Five years ago, we were commissioned to design a complex in Singapore, approximately 10 million square feet. Uh, it was called an integrated resort. It was to be built on landfill, which is uh, across from the downtown forming a bay in what used to be the open harbor. Um, I would like to say a few things about planning in Singapore in the course of presenting this project because I would say up front right now that whatever you will see unfolding would not have occurred if it was not for a very proactive urban redevelopment authority with very particular guidelines and ideas about how the city should be developed, beginning with the landfill and forming a basin and so on and so forth. So that's the landfill. Uh, and the site that was put out for uh, international competition to developers, each with their own architect. Uh, this is a site in relationship to the downtown. Uh, you see here, this is actually the model from the competition. And uh, let me begin by saying that in taking on this project, which has hotels, a casino, convention center. My wife, in fact, said, you really want to get involved with a project that has a casino in it? Um, I thought there was uh, an extraordinary opportunity here to try and rethink the public realm in a very high density urban context. Could we create a new kind of public realm? I go back to Bath and the first slide I showed. Could you create a kind of combination of indoor outdoor spaces that can suggest what public realm could be all about and the ura on its part said we want to develop a continuous public promenade that connects the entire downtown and this project should be the kind of catalyst for creating that loop the other thought that went through my mind is you can't treat this as a building. You've got to think about it as a city. If you get into a certain scale and you continue thinking building scale and building structure, I think it is doomed to failure. And I went back thinking about the, the Madaba plan of Byzantine Jerusalem, which like all Roman cities had the Cardo Maximus, of course had the city wall, but it had all the main public buildings plugged into this spine of urban life going from gate to gate. And I started thinking if they want a promenade on the waterfront, and we have lots of shopping in the program for our project, perhaps the spine of urban life could become the integration of an indoor, outdoor, air-conditioned, non-air-conditioned public place that runs across with its the Camonus and the Cardo Maximus and all other program components are then plugins to that spine of urban life. And so as it resolved itself, here is that spine, indoor and outdoor, and plugged into it, convention center, theaters, museum, shopping, casino, uh, lots of hotel rooms, uh, and a whole network of open public spaces, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. And the key was a cross-section that said outdoor life, indoor life, air-conditioned, open to nature, the water, integrate the two so they can open one to the other in certain climates that can even transform like a convertible, open and shut to the elements depending on the season. And with several levels, subway hitting, uh, serving some floors, the street street system, other floors, parking from below, you get a multi-level public realm that's in part outdoors, as you see here, along the water, and in part, you see here the outdoor spaces in various 
aspects of public use, night light shows and other uh, public events, and then moving indoors into air conditioning and opening up to each other at night so that you have constant movement from indoor to outdoor, a spine of activity which is not only retail but also mixed with cultural and other facilities. And being Singapore, then also transparency on one hand, but shade pervades everywhere. And as a urban complex then, there are the sequence of outdoor spaces, the promenade, the entire roof of the podium building, which is public park, and then finally, the idea of a, of a sky park crowning the hotels as both a public, private, and public and private outdoor spaces, including a public observatory. And even the hotel spaces create this public realm of a network of streets that in interconnect. So here is the sky park as it overlooks the city, the public side of it, the private side of it, uh, the swimming pool that overlooks the city. Swim anybody? <laughs> and the entire network of two and a half acres of park in the sky, which has transformed the city. And people just flock to be there and feel that there's another kind of public realm that's now available to them, which unfortunately they charge too much money to go up to. And uh, the feature that this government of Singapore insisted on would be that on the promontory there would be a cultural building that represents the spirit of Singapore. Well, what would that cultural building be? And my client said, oh, it's not important, just make an iconic building. <laughs> I said, I don't know how to do it without knowing what's going to happen in it. He says, who cares? <laughs> well, we thought that since Singapore has museums, it has a science museum, it has lots of uh, art museums, it's got an aquarium, it's got concert halls, it's got, what shall we do? So I proposed a museum of art science, written as one word, where the arts and the sciences and the unity between them would be explored. Well, the Singaporeans like that. The building is made up of this floating structure with galleries within it which reached up for the light, very exuberant, draining the entire building through the center courtyard. And then more traditional galleries below the podium uh, for changing exhibitions. But I'd like to touch a bit about how a building that began basically as a free form, as an idea, uh, was then rationalized so that it became buildable in an efficient way. We first explored spherical geometries because they would be highly ordered and repetitive in terms of the component parts. They did not work and so we turned to spheroids. The spheroids tend to be very uh, effective in defining the individual fingers uh, of each of the uh, elements in the structure. We then realized that by tweaking the radii slightly of the various uh, uh, components, we could get the autonomy or the identity of each of them within the whole. And then the parametric model seemed a bit clumped, and so we tweaked it uh, slightly and unclumped it, and that in turn translated very effectively into a series of drawings generated by the parametric model from which the building was manufactured. The all component parts, the skin, the structure itself, and so on. And working very closely with Arab, a structure evolved which took the asymmetry of this and centered it around this uh, diagrid in the center that tied the whole building down from top to bottom to the ground and took on the structure. These are the galleries within still being worked on. The light, an exhibit, one of the exhibits within one of those galleries, and so on and so forth. The building sits on the promenade and is now part of the urban life of the city. I want to change scale and talk about the very particular nature uh, of projects as 
I personally experienced it, and how a place and a program inform a design in a very specific, site-specific way. And I'd, I'll do this in a sequence as some of these projects have sort of merged into each other. The, I, I want to begin with the Children's Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem, which I was asked to do in 1976. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the archive of the uh, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, and I was uh, baffled how to make a museum dedicated to the children when everybody coming out of there, uh, of, of the historic museum, would have been totally saturated with, with information uh, about what had happened. And so how do you do another place of information uh, dedicated to the children. And so I started thinking in terms of a, an alternative. Uh, there was a kind of natural cave on the site and I proposed we uh, dig underground and create a large chamber under the, in the bedrock. And I proposed that instead of a museum, you'll have an anteroom with some of the photographs of the children who perished. And then in the center of that space, there would be a single memorial candle and by a geometry of uh, glass walls and semi-reflective walls, it would reflect into infinity, uh, into millions of candles. There's a voice that reads the name of the children and their age and place of birth. Um, the design was actually rejected in 1976. Uh, by the way, you then move through it and come to the north and it opens up into light and into life as you emerge from the other side of the mountain. Um, the design was rejected in 76. It was said to be uh, too abstract. People would misunderstand. They might think it's a discotheque. And it was only 10 years later in 86 that uh, a man who and his wife who lost their son, two-year-old son in Auschwitz, saw the model that was still there, wrote a check as these things happen, and it was built in 86. So uh, a few years, about, I guess now it's 12 years ago, uh, on one of my visits to Jerusalem, I was called by the foreign ministry who said, we have here the chief minister of the Punjab, uh, who is on a state visit. We've taken him to the Children Memorial and he broke down and asked to meet the architect. Could you come to his hotel and meet him? And uh, I immediately went there and met the chief minister of the Punjab, Badil. He told me about the fact that, as he put it, we the Sikh people have suffered a great deal in our 500-year history. We are building a museum that will tell the story of our people. I want you to come and design it. And you know what we go through architects before we get a job these days. So it all sounded improbable. Uh, but two weeks later, I was in the Punjab. They took me to see the Golden Temple, which is the most sacred place for the Sikhs. And then they took me to this small town outside Chandigarh, uh, in which there is this uh, Gurdwara, the temple. And uh, we looked around for a site. Uh, I suggested we stay walking distance and propose this hillocks with the valley coming right through them, which is walking distance from the temple as a site, which Indian style got purchased within two weeks. Uh, and off we were to our work. How do you make a building feel that it belongs in a very controversial situation where most, most of the Sikhs were screaming, what's the chief minister doing importing an architect? And what does that Israeli, American, Canadian know about Sikhism? Um, these were some of the sketches I made uh, on the way back home. This is Jaisalmer, for those of you who know it, uh, one of the fortress cities in the Rajasthan. And Sikh culture is all about fortresses and defense. And I was thinking of the the sand cliffs and sort of the building rising uh, in sandstone out of the sand cliffs. And I came back with this model proposing uh, the, the galleries which tell the story of the Sikhs on one side of the valley 
and the library and changing exhibitions and auditorium connected to the town, making the valley into water gardens in a Sikh tradition connected by a pedestrian bridge. Well, the controversy uh, over uh, a foreigner designing it subsided. Um, and then I came back four months later, we're still doing design development drawings, but the bridge was built. <laughs> and shortly thereafter, there was a groundbreaking ceremony and uh, half a million people showed up. And I tell you about it simply to emphasize the significance this project had for the people of Punjab and for Sikhs generally. Uh, and that question of belonging being so central. This is a building uh, as it was opened last November. It took a decade. I had the good fortune to have Ryan Dillon spend several years of his life as a resident architect. Hence, you would see that it's uh, pretty beautifully finished. Uh, sandstone, uh, architecture concrete, stainless steel roofs reflecting the south light towards the town. Um, the bridge and the permanent galleries, the water gardens, all lit up at night. And last November, during the opening, part of the exhibits were installed. They were fabricated all over India. From the north, as you arrive, it's almost windowless, fortress-like, uh, rising out of the uh, sand structure as you approach it. And within, the exhibits were fabricated by craftsmen all over India. They're quite amazing way to tell large crowds about the history of the Sikhs. And as you walk through the public watching the exhibition and the exhibits merge into one and just extraordinary feeling of the unity of both the exhibits and the people experiencing them. In the meantime, Yad Vashem had decided to completely rebuild the historic museum uh, in Jerusalem, uh, in part because there was so much more information than the, than the exhibit and building built in the 50s, in part because the Washington Museum became the uh, more comprehensive museum on the Holocaust. I, this was not the minister calling and saying, I want you to do it. This was a three-phase international competition in which we participated and uh, won. And I remember uh, starting to work on the competition. My feeling was all the things I did not want to do, more than what I did want to do. I did not want a big 30,000 square uh, meter building on top of the uh, on top of this uh, pastoral mountain. Uh, I thought it should stay pretty well as it is. There's a historic museum that uh, eventually was to be replaced, and I did not want a building that's like business as usual, which is sort of full of architectural detail or has a presence of any kind. And so I started thinking in terms of cutting through the mountain, and coming in one end and coming out of the other side and having a museum essentially underground, in and out and the museum below ground. I was thinking in terms of a non-building like archaeology or in this case uh, a quarry in Spain, a stone quarry, and you see here the leftover volumes with light penetrating from above. And I thought, that's the kind of space, in fact, if I could carve it into the Jerusalem bedrock, I would have, but it was too soft. Uh, you see the building as it's completed. It enters the mountain at one end. It emerges on the other. These are the skylights that bring light to the galleries. That's the old memorial hall which we preserved. And as you come from a, a reception building, you cross a bridge, you enter, and cuts through the floor, force you from one chapter to the other. So the narrative is imposed on you as you move from one chapter to the other until you come to light at the other end. Uh, when you enter Yad Vashem, you come to this building which ser has services in it. 
uh, a word about symbolism. Uh, soon after the opening, I came for a visit and there were uh, groups with guides. Um, many of the visitors arrived by bus with guides. And there was a guy telling them that the architect had designed this with this light coming through this trellis so that everybody who comes in has stripes on their clothes uh, as a result of the shadows to remember the prisoners with the striped uniform in the camps. <laughs> and I thought, that's a damn good story, except I did not think of it. <laughs> But I, I tell you that because it shows you to what extent we as architects think we can uh, tweak symbolism or tell people what they should be thinking symbolically when they experience our buildings. It's a waste of time <laughs> because symbolism is completely subjective, something generated at the personal level and totally unpredictable. Yad Vashem is full of such so there's a bridge which I thought should be a little shaky as you go in and it's covered with wood and you enter this concrete prism which basically narrows as you get into it and then opens up towards the uh, end and shoots out uh, outside over cantilevering over the mountain. And as you enter the light comes from above, the floor descends at 5% slope and eventually starts climbing up again towards the light. You always see the light at the end of the tunnel, but you can't quite get there because these exhibits in the floor force you to move from side to side. And there's nothing but concrete and the exhibits and glass. And as you descend, the light coming from above is further and further away and here too, the visitors and the exhibits sometimes merge into each other in a frightening way. And towards the end, there is a hall of names where the files of all the known names, three million known names, three million unknown names are stored. I proposed that they'd be stored in a cylinder within which there would be a cone with photographs from those files and then carving into the bedrock deep into the earth the place of the names that will never be known. And you see here the just photographs from the files rising towards the light and looking down the natural bedrock and the uh, ground water with a reflection of the photographs above. And towards Emerging from the museum, the last word was really for the architect. I felt that after experiencing this horrific story, one should come back with a certain affirmation of life. And so the prism opens up towards the view of the forestation of Jerusalem, uh, that life prevailed. And we, uh, we are here. There it is, cantilevering over the mountain where people look out to the forestation, the post-tensioning rods that made this extraordinary country lever possible. So to change setting, culture, subject, and I show them in this sequence because uh, I think they say something about the sensibility of trying to understand the place. This is Bentonville, Arkansas the birthplace of Walmart. Do you have Walmarts in England? No, you're lucky. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, actually. We have them, but they're called Asda. Oh. Well, this is downtown Bentonville, where Walmart was born. Don't be misled by the word downtown. Uh, it looks like a setting out of a Western movie. Uh, but it's a very, very mid-American place. And Alice Walton, the heiress of uh, the founder of Walmart, has deci decided, she has done it now, to build a museum and cultural center devoted to uh, American art in order to uplift the quality of life of the entire region. Um, and uh, 
again through a story that uh, I'll skip at this point. Uh, at one moment, I responded to an invitation to visit her there. She had done her own visits to museums by various architects. And at the end of that day, I said, oh, you're going to start your architecture selection process. How are you going to go about it? Thinking, competition, interview, etc." And she said, no, I ended it tonight. And uh, that was the beginning of an amazing relationship. This is the family estate next to the downtown. And I decided to build at the bottom of the valley. Uh, the, the hills are extraordinarily mature, beautiful trees. And I thought if we build in the stream bed, we would disturb uh, the land the least. But of course, that meant flood plains. And that meant the Corps of Engineers. Uh, and it meant a lot of, but there it is, a single, um, it's, the, it's, it's obviously the drainage path, but there's also a, a spring, crystal spring, hence crystal bridges. And I started thinking in terms of damming the valley. And if, I, if we dam the valley, we could create some ponds. And these ponds uh, would be at different levels. And that could become kind of the place. The, that would give the place its focal point as you built around it, uh, at the, all of it at the bottom of the valley. And so these are the two ponds as they formed uh, the water flowing this way with the various galleries forming a loop and coming around and trails from all over the region leading to the museum from different directions and of course vehicular access. One of my first sketches of the ponds with the buildings around it, it was at this point that I felt one way to make this really feel part of Arkansas would be to build it out of wood and out of local wood. Uh, local pine wood, and maybe we could really evolve a technology that took wood uh, into new places. And here you see the structure as completed last year, um, downtown Bentonville down there, uh, the two ponds. You arrive from above, you descend, galleries coming around, uh, great hall and auditorium over there, the curatorial wing, all nestled. Uh, and uh, you can see here the combination of a dam and the bridge. The, f the, the floor is a dam that holds the pond, and the roof structure is literally a bridge spanning from one side of the valley to the other. Uh, it's, it's a cable structure supporting a series of laminated wood beams. Cables from end to end, the dam structure below, different galleries with their own light control systems under this great bridge structure. And the mock-ups, which we evolved to evolve laminated wood beam structures that were able to be braced and form uh, rather intricate structures using, um, and this was done actually with Bureau Happel, uh, who, is, uh, who are uh, headquartered in Bath. And so the language of the building is wood, concrete vertical structure with wood inlay where the concrete ties are so that they basically, you get the layers of the concrete being poured with the wood ties in between. And as you approach the site of the museum, you don't see it at all except just the drop off. And it's only when you come close to the elevator tower that you discover it nestled below you. And then you descend. And that is the first bridge, which is the gathering place of the museum and its cafe and restaurant, the laminated beams and the two ponds on either side. And then as we move about, we're guided as we move around the ponds, galleries, galleries all around. American galleries, and then you come to the next bridge, art indoors and outdoors, and that's where we have these buildings within a building. You've got daylight uncontrolled, and then controlled daylight in the galleries, a beautiful, soft, even light that can be controlled in terms of its level. And coming around, and more galleries, and so on, 
and so forth. The auditorium and just the site, the building and the site completely intertwined. So wherever this, the building crosses a drainage path, this becomes an experience where the drainage comes right under the building and these become places of gathering and these are the trails outside connecting different parts of the site. So I'd like, almost in conclusion, to show a project which was a competition we lost. But I still feel good about it, so why not? But this, was the, this is a competition for the National Museum of, Chi of Art of China. This is the bird's nest, that's the site. Um, this is a water, a water uh, network that was created to extend the Beijing spine right through the uh, site. Uh, you wouldn't believe it, but under this ceremonial water system, the Chinese built a shopping center. So actually that's a shopping center with a roof that's made up of a pond. Um, I thought somehow as inspiration I was thinking of the caves of Danghuang where there are infinite number of caves, a big number of caves with great art in them as kind of the, the sort of oldest museum of China which are these rooms that are sort of uh, organized along a cliff and started thinking in terms of creating that kind of a cliff with gardens uh, rising above it. The cross section for the building is a series of galleries and then curatorial space uh, with a suspended tensile roof stretching over with gardens, sculpture gardens forming under and total transparency towards the axis. So it's a building actually with a very much a front and a back. And it's a museum which is very much in the tradition of the extrovert building that tells you of the life within it uh, on the outside. Unlike, the, this came down to four finalists, uh, Zaha, Frank Gehry, and uh, Nouvelle. And though we have not seen the official outcome, we know that Nouvelle won it. Um, so here are the sort of cliffs with the galleries that you enter and exit coming back to that cliff with these two large structures on either side, the entry pavilion acting as a buttresses for the tensile structure that uh, overhangs the garden. And then very much in the tradition of sort of the gardens and terracing of in China, there's that whole sculpture garden that forms on the roof and the main axis crossing the building in both directions. I won't go into the details, but just indulge me. <laughs> the last project is the United States Institute of Peace, which was also opened last year on this corner, which is the last site on the National Mall. Now, in the United States, I asked in a talk, I, 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 make a, I do a survey, who knows about the U United States Institute of Peace, and I get about five hands up. I bet you here there isn't even one person probably. Who knows about the United States Institute of Peace? Oh, one, well, that's pretty good. Well, formed by Congress 20 years ago uh, as a counterpoint to the Pentagon, as a national agency in pursuit of conflict resolution and peace initiatives. But somehow it didn't become a household word. And so the decision was to give them an extraordinarily prominent site on the mall. And this also being a competition, it seemed to me obvious that if you were building the Institute of Peace somewhere downtown Washington, it would be an office building, conference center, whatever. But being across the Lincoln Memorial and next to the Vietnam Memorial makes it a symbolic building. Treacherous ground again. How do you make a building belong to Washington with its extraordinary kind of classical tradition and uh, somehow have a sense that it's all about peace? I was thinking in terms of a building that glows and that is white and that is light and 
I started thinking in terms of a series of translucent roofs that would bring light into the building but might blow at night and sort of uh, just float out there. The building itself organized itself around two atria, one public facing Lincoln and one more private, the research and, and conference arm that looks towards the Potomac. And we started evolving a number of very light 20 centimeter shell roofs made up of white glass and white film, which became spherical and toroidal and which you see here in model form and in the final building as it's built with precast concrete bearing walls and that structure floating on top. You see it there with the various wings of the building and the central space which brings light to every working space in the building and view for that matter. And this sort of white light that glows very soft and transforming at night as the light is seen from within. So in conclusion, a few words. I'm often asked what inspires me as an architect. It's a kind of very re repeating journalist question. And, and I said that, you know, they expect a list of all the buildings that have inspired me, and many have. But in the final analysis, what inspires me as an architect is, is studying design and nature and understanding design and nature. Um, I think it's about fitness. I came, I came to understand. Uh, many years ago, uh, Lou Kahn introduced me to the uh, Darcy Thompson's book on growth and form, it was really the book that originated the, the science of morphology. The causality between a form and fitness in, its, in terms of how it evolved. And I came to connect beauty with fitness. Beauty is what we perceive when we feel fitness. And I realize that that is very much the way scientists think about beauty and fitness. Um, mathematicians talk about beauty. Uh, for example, Hardy talks about the mathematicians' patterns, like the painters and the poets, must be beautiful. The ideas like the colors, the, the words, must fit together harmoniously. Beauty is the first test. There is no permanent place in the world for ugly mathematics. And um, the morphologist uh, Cook said, beauty connotes humanity. We call a natural object beautiful because we see that its form expresses fitness, the perfect fulfillment of function in the lines of structure. And I'd like to conclude with a poem which I wrote in 1980 uh, in the conclusion of my book, Form and Purpose. And this morning I realized the uncanny connection with the motto of the AA. The motto of the AA is designed with beauty, build in truth. I didn't know that till this morning. Um, and I wrote, he who seeks truth shall find beauty. He who seeks beauty shall find vanity. He who seeks order shall find gratification. He who seeks gratification shall be disappointed. He who considers himself the servant of his fellow beings shall find the joy of self-expression. He who seeks self-expression shall fall into the pit of arrogance. Arrogance is incompatible with nature. Through the nature of the universe and the nature of man, we shall seek truth. If we seek truth, we shall find beauty. Thank you very much.
If we could, we could open up and take a few questions. Hello, Mr. Safta. Uh, very pre appreciate your speech. Uh, I'm interested in your project of, of the habitat. So my question is, uh, you said people prefer to live in here. So I'm in interested about why, what is system you design embedded into a project makes it so comfortable and can create so many diversity of space? What is kind of system? Your question is about habitat in Montreal? Yeah, the first one. Yeah. I think, I think what happened with Habitat is first there were many visitors, like 50 million people came to Expo. And so people who didn't live there just visited the project. They were kind of uh, amazed that, that you could rethink that, that urban living could be like that. So there was this kind of sense of, is that really achievable or possible? Uh, there was a, a great excitement about it, but a kind of an air of disbelief. The people who moved in there, they settle very rapidly to the kind of life, I mean, it has a rich community life. People have their gardens and they grow their vegetables. I mean, it is not like living in an apartment and people, it just resonated with the way people want to live. And in fact, it's fascinating to go back. Many of the original residents, more aged, but still there, and even second generations have moved into the building, their children and so on. So it's. Uh, it's a real community, I guess that's what you could say about it. And we know how many utopian projects were built in, this, in the 20th century that didn't work out in terms of the life that, that was promised in them. So I think at least we know if we can't, rep if we can't uh, proliferate with it, it's, it's still a model that people want to be in, to live in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, from the very beginning, you started your lecture with the idea of how uh, architecture grows from the particular site and how it relates to its historical and cultural um, specific um, parts, let's say. And I was just wondering that <coughs> Right after this, you were showing the project um, in developed in New York, uh, this high density project. And in New York? Yeah, you started from New York and you were trying to map the Manhattan um, density. Ah, you mean the, uh, the theoretical yeah, project? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And the specific morphology was developed right after this, but then it was replicated to China and to Singapore. And I was just wondering if there is any kind of relationship of this first theme you were trying to speak about? I, I should explain that when we did the fellowship, we were not site specific. And in fact, we took New York as a model in terms of density and the mixed use. But I was not thinking New York in terms of place or climate specifically in doing the, the, the hypothetical project. What uh, what then happened is, in starting to work on the project in China, some of the issues were, were generic. The fact that you're doing high-rise structure that could be wall-like on the seashore, but really people want it to be more porous, these were issues similar to what we developed in New York. But in terms of housing, as you go to very high densities, and, and I start thinking of what we're doing today in Chongqing, China, what we're building in Singapore, what we're doing in, say, Colombo. Um, it's much more difficult at those densities, much more difficult to localize them. Uh, the human intervention is of a scale that it almost overcomes. So there's obvious things, like you're doing it in a tropical climate, buildings will be used in different ways, terraces will be used in, if I do a habitat today in Montreal, I know from experience or in New York, that people want to have convertible spaces, they want to be able to enclose it at winter, uh, there'd be more, uh, you know, generous use of glazing and so on, but it's not the same, when you do a museum or you do a cultural building, 
uh, and you do it at the scale of, of what most institutions are like, the sense of place can be, uh, can be expressed and discovered much more powerfully than when you're doing a 100-story high complex of 15 towers in, in Chongqing, China. It's, uh, and it's a dilemma. It's a dilemma. So your finger went on a tough problem. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for your lecture. It was really interesting. My question is also related about culture understanding. So you're dealing in a global context where you have built in many places. So first of all, how you go about understanding a culture which is most of the time foreign um, so as not to give a superficial response? And secondly, uh, how you deal about your project creating a new culture in the same time? The last part of the question, how do I go? In a sense, a, a big project or important project builds its own culture around it. No. I'm sorry, I still didn't understand the last <laughs> half. So first, how do you understand the culture so as not to give a superficial response? Yeah, this I understand. Okay, and second, a project creates a new culture around oh, it. Okay, yeah. So how? That's, that's a good question. I think that in terms of learning about a place, um, your starting point is somewhat important. Uh, you know, I grew up in the East, uh, then I was educated in the West, so I think if you've moved about in your life, you probably have your antennas a little more focused uh, than if, you've grown, if, you, if you were brought up in a very homogeneous, singular kind of place. Not necessarily, but I think it, it does make it easy. But it's clear that you're going to some places where you feel more familiar. Like when I was working in Iran, it felt completely familiar because you know I grew up in the Middle East. Uh, even India, northern India, is familiar. When I'm building in China, it's like another world. You know, I'm. It's uh, and it takes a lot of uh, of uh, of looking and, and reading and, and spending time and, and being open to understanding it. And I, I'm far from, you know, I'm working on, most of my work is in China, but I'm, I feel much less sure-footed in understanding the place at this point than I did, say, working in India or the Middle East. So I think the more unfamiliar the culture, the more energy and time it's gonna take, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And I think it seems to be the reality of the day that many of us are going to be working all over the place in cultures that are new to us and we're not familiar. I'm not sure I'm answering how you don't get superficial. You don't get superficial by not allowing yourself to fall into the trap of pastiche. I mean, it's so easy. Uh, the essence of a place is not always its formal signs. I think too often, like American architects working in the Middle East, we're looking at the forms uh, literally as kind of a way to connect. And uh, it comes out as caricature. So there is a real risk out there. I'll answer you tw in two different ways. Intellectually, I'm convinced that, that immer immersing yourself in the program is fundamental to creating a building that has fitness about it. I think if you don't, uh, you get buildings that are in tension with what goes on in them. And buildings that are in tension with what goes in, in, in them show it very rapidly. I mean, we know many buildings that were built and just didn't work, and you know, people eventually either changed them or whatever, because there was not that sense of fitness. So intellectually, I'm convinced that, that we have to be extremely, not just attentive, but inspired by that program. Now, 
the reason I'm answering it two ways is it's not simple because take a school. A program for a school is a complex, complex statement. It's subjective. I remember years ago I was asked to design a school in Baltimore, part of a major complex we were doing. And they were sold on a concept called team teaching. Team teaching is 150 kids in the class with four different teachers at the same time. And it was all premised on the idea that if you have a bad teacher, when there's four together with 150 kids, it'll be less serious. And I started working <coughs> following the program, which meant very large classrooms that were like warehouse-like spaces. <laughs> and I had kids at that age then going to school at the same grades. And I resigned from the commission uh, after a while because I did not believe team teaching made any sense. So when you say program, it's subject to a lot of interpretation. And we as architects get a program. Often what it says is quantitative, and it often says nothing about qualitative. So the interpretation of program and adding to it what might not be straightforward stated is part of that process. I think, I think going back to what I quoted Khan, let a building be what it wants to be, is what Khan was saying, we've got to listen to it before we can really hear what the building is all about. You know, you, we've got we to understand it like he's person, personifying the kind of essence of a program that we need to understand, because it's not always stated for us as architects. Hi, first of all, thanks, uh, thanks for the presentation. I think it's very beautiful work. Uh, I'm gonna make a question that is gonna be very related with what we've been working on over the last couple of months. I think your efforts to try to rethink housing, high density housing, are very valuable. Uh, I was wondering whether, because it's something we've been dealing, as I said, a couple, uh, over the last couple of months, whether you've ever think of adaptability from the point of view of probably architecture not being necessarily static, how can a building adapt over time uh, to deal with uh, changes in density, changes in, in lifestyle, in program, whether you've ever think about it or you don't think it's relevant at all, or if it is, uh, if, if you think it's something that's gonna have to be dealt with over the, last, the next couple of years? I think, I think it's very relevant, and I think about it all the time. And I think about it when, when, when I look back historically uh, and I look at sometimes interventions in, in older cities, uh, you see a building type like a monastery or uh, a convent uh, that have been transformed into a wonderful university building or into a, a very romantic hotel. And so you say there's something about the typology and in the case of a convent it might be just the courtyard typology uh, that's adaptable so that you can take something that was built for one reason and make it something else and, and, and it still works. And similarly, you can think of buildings uh, like modern hotels, slab building, totally unadaptable. You can't make an office building out of it because the structural grid is wrong and uh, you can't make housing out of it or it's tough, very unadaptable. Um, in terms of my personal experience, I built Habitat with some idea, lots of variety. One, two, or three boxes make up an apartment. So if you're single, you take one box. You got four kids, you take three boxes. And you know you can combine them in different ways. And lo and behold, 40 years later, people buy one apartment. They buy the one next door. They ask for permission to make a hole. They connect it this way. They don't like my fiberglass bathroom, so they do one in marble. And you go there today, and there's everything from uh, uh, you know, Versailles all the way to cutting, you know, cutting corner minimalist and totally transformed environments, which tells me that when we do housing particularly, we should be trying to reduce the design of the dwelling to the most, the least interventionist uh, kind of palette for people to transform. 
And that's tougher than designing a very clever plan that works, you know? Uh, because that means it's like a beehive where you give them the, the bees the imprinting of the geometry and then they, they, they themselves build the stuff. You have in housing to find a way to give the shell that then can be transformed. It has to have enough light, it has to have enough exposure, but I think that is definitely something to achieve. And I think in terms of the robustness of ideas in architecture, the more robust, the more adaptable buildings tend to be. So I think in any typology, there is the very specific pinning it down to the last detail, not flexible, and being more general, and allowing for that flexibility of transformation. Uh, hello. Yeah. I just have a, I just have a question. Um, uh, uh, thank you for doing for such wonderful work through your career. It's a great inspiration. Uh, I visited your your projects in Habitat 67 and the Marina Bay Sands. And uh, it was great to see it in reality and see how people were living in the spaces. And just, I wanted to ask you about your Art Science Museum. Um, I was really kind of intrigued by the space or as the kind of the object as an anchor to kind of bring you around the bridge. And I really looked forward to visiting the spaces because uh, the art science really resonates with me as an architect. But I suppose the one thing I suppose that disappointed me, and it's of no reflection of yourself, is that how it was taken over by the curators and the exhibition, it kind of made me feel a bit more hollow that it didn't deserve to be in the building. And I wondered about the challenge for architects in terms of when a building is taken over and how that the idea continues to resonate and if, if there's more we can do in terms of that occupation. It's a painful question because it's painful because I spent uh, a, long, a lot of energy putting together a committee uh, with some fascinating people from science and from art, from museums, and they wrote a wonderful, uh, more than a report, a program of five years of exhibitions for that building. Um, and they had to do with, for example, uh, taste and smell going from cuisine all the way to the science of smell and uh, just extraordinary. A moment in time, relativity, uh, the emergence of cinema, uh, and cubism. And these things really began to show what you could do. Uh, the developer, as, uh, as uh, developers tend to be, said, oh, this is highbrow, nobody will come, we're going to lose even more money on your crazy building. Um, and then they said, what this needs to be is a roadhouse. We're going to get blockbusters. The next thing we know is we had uh, all kinds of exhibitions. It actually drew a lot of people, uh, but we're not about art science. So there's only the fourth floor that, out of obligation, they still have something about art science. Now, I hope that uh, there'll be full cycle and they'll have a few road shows and somebody will come to their senses and says, maybe that's an idea we should pursue. And I mentioned before Singapore as a, as a place to work in and, and the government. They reinforced everything we proposed in the, in the original design in terms of implementation. So sky park, gardens, whatever, they insisted. But when it came to the content of the museum, they did not. They just let it go. So I think that was unfortunate. But you, 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 you caught something painful. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you very much. But I don't much. know how to answer you how we can influence that. I mean, we work hard to try and influence, but in this particular case, I just failed. Well, it was a, the whole experience of the Marina Sands was wonderful, and the, the pool and the view and how it experienced the city. It really made Singapore, so well done. <laughs> thank you. I don't forget doing the whole thing, so that's okay. <laughs> Last call for questions. Anybody else would like to ask a question to Mr. Safdi? No. One more? If there's no questions, then maybe we could bring today to a close. And please thank Mr. Safdi for his time. Thanks. Thanks.